Resting on our shoulders is the most complex object in the known universe. 86 billion neurons, each connected to 10,000 others. From Plato to Descartes to the modern day, philosophers have largely been ignorant of the workings of the brain, despite many questions in philosophy seeming to be intimately linked with its nature. Questions like, what are the origins of our moral intuitions, our conscience? What is the nature of decision-making, and how does the brain produce consciousness? Following the recent upsurge of interest and research into neuroscience, reaching full steam in the 1970s, Patricia Churchland describes the emergence of neurophilosophy as inevitable, coining the term in her now classic book, Neurophilosophy, toward a unified science of the mind-brain in 1986. Alongside neurophilosophy, Patricia Churchland is best known for her books Touching a Nerve, Brain Trust, and most recently Conscience, which, together with hundreds of other publications, interviews, public talks and awards, have led her to be considered one of, if not the, world's leading neurophilosopher. Currently Professor Emerita in philosophy at the University of California, San Diego, Patricia Churchland has knocked down the wall between science and philosophy, inspiring a new wave of thinking about life's most challenging questions. For some, however, the wall was there for a reason. Questions of philosophy should not be confused with questions of science. After all, what can neuroscience tell us about the origin of consciousness or the nature of morality? Before we get going, we want to say a huge thank you to Cullum St. Gabriel's and West Hill Endowment for supporting the show, as well as all of our humdinging patrons. We love you from the bottom of our mole hills to the top of our mountains and back. A very special thank you to our most esteemed patrons, David Ligeness, Lily Hooper, Mr. T, Jimmy Casperson, Maroon van der Kolk, Adam Cole, and Jim Clare. Thank you all. Your support means the absolute world to us. Producing the show requires a lot of time and resources, as you all know, and we're incredibly grateful for everybody who shows their support, in particular those we've just listed. Pluck us from the jaws of death and hit the link in the iTunes description. And welcome to episode 84 of the Pansai Cast. I'm the man who wishes that buying an Austin Devon was his worst mistake, Mr. Jack Symes, and I'm joined once again by the morally depraved maniac spraying oxytocin up his nose, Mr. Andrew Horton. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> his life is an Aristotelian balancing act. It's Mr. Ollie Marley. Hello. Having logic chopping arguments in the supermarket about whether or not parsley is really and truly a vegetable, Dr. Gregory Miller. Hello. And the neurophilosopher breaking philosophers out of their black and white rooms, Professor Patricia Churchland. Hello, hello. Very good to be here. <laughs> it's great to have you on the show, Pat. We always kick off with asking our guests some introductory questions. The first one of always is, what is philosophy? So what is philosophy? And as a follow-up, what is neurophilosophy? Well, I thought about it in 1986, and how I still think about it actually, is that there are these grand old questions that have been asked by philosophers both in, in the East and in the West. And they have to do with such things as how do we make decisions and why do we sometimes make bad decisions? What is, what is it to have self-control? How is it that we can learn things? And why is it that we can learn things that perhaps a dog cannot or that a dog has a capacity for smelling things that we do not? Mm. And these all seem to me to be really important and really interesting questions. And they bear upon our social life as well. But what was new for me starting in, in the 1960s was you could begin to see how neuroscience, how the study of the physical brain had data that bore upon those questions. That's not to say that they were completely answered by that, but the data were relevant. And that was just very exciting to me. So you say there that there are these uh, important and exciting questions. In our interview with Daniel Dennett, he said that he told us that well, what he thought philosophy was, for instance, was 
philosophy, sorted out the questions, sorted out the concepts, and then passed those concepts and questions on to science. And then the scientists figure out the answers. Do you agree with this idea? Do you think philosophy is just science's question and answer, I mean, question and concept sorting machine, and then science takes over? I think Dan and I have always disagreed about this. Um, and, and that is the idea that philosophers can do this special thing of clarifying concepts and cleaning up concepts and making them precise independently of the science is actually nuts. And I say that because what we know is that concepts change as the sciences mm. proceed. We know this, for example, about the concept of atom mm -hmm. uh, or about heat or about temperature, that the very concept itself is clarified, refined, better defined as the science proceeds. So there is always this kind of toing and froing between those who think in kind of the large scale and those who are doing experiments. And for me, uh, that suggests that there is mm. no really interesting distinction between science and philosophy. And I think Aristotle would have agreed, actually. How is it that you first got into neurophilosophy? Um, how did your brain get interested in philosophizing about itself and other people's brains? I think it was when I was a graduate student at Oxford. And at that time, I realized that many of the questions I was interested in having to do with say, the nature of consciousness or how perception works, were questions that philosophers thought they could answer without knowing anything. That is, without knowing any science, any psychology or any neuroscience. And as with all graduate students, I sort of chortled away about this and talked about it to other graduate students. And I think a number of us came to the view that if philosophy is just about words and has nothing to do with the science of what the words are about, then it's kind of a waste of time. And so when I first took a job um, in the University of Manitoba, Paul and I were both there, this really nagged at me. And Paul and I, of course, talked about it a lot. And Finally, I thought, you know, I just have to know about whatever it is that neuroscientists know about the brain. And one of the things that at that time really got me were the split brain results. Mm -hmm. And that is because at, when the corpus callosum that stretched between the two cortical hemispheres, when the corpus callosum was cut, it was possible for one hemisphere to learn something that the other one didn't or to know something that the other one didn't. This is amazing. Whatever dualism had as its sort of logical ballast had the crap kicked out of it. That <laughs> if you can separate consciousness by cutting the brain in half, the game is over. Mm. And so, so that really drove me into the arms of the neurology department at the University of Manitoba Medical School. And, and we were all interested in the split brain results, but then there were so much more. And I began to see patients as well as do basic neuroscience dissections on brains and cells and so forth. And suddenly my world totally changed. And I just became obsessed and fascinated with what I was learning, especially from human subjects with various kinds of brain damage. Uh, so, Pat, uh, this next question, uh, I think, is quite interesting because you have an incredibly uh, varied and, and interesting body of work. Um, but unlike some other figures, for some reason, a lot of this work seems to gather quite a lot of controversy. Um, so, for example, <laughs> in relation to your own, to your own work, uh, Raymond Tallis named you, quote, the queen of neuromania. And uh, Colin McGinn dismissed your work as, quote, neuroscience cheerleading. Now, apart from these being quite unprofessional, inappropriate and, you know, just not very <laughs> philosophical in themselves, uh, what is it, do you think, about your work that kind of provokes these quite strong reactions? It's hard to say. I mean, that's kind of like asking me, why don't people like me? Um, <laughs> some people do, but, but I think it, in my own case, it's probably not easy to separate the fact 
that I am a female and it doesn't really occur to me that I should be especially deferential to the men around me. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, coming from the farm and being a very practical person, I also have a tendency to be rather blunt. Mm-hmm. Perhaps men with rather, you know, fragile egos or something, maybe they don't like that. <laughs> but having said that, of course, it's also true that There are lots of female philosophers who don't like me one bit either. To a certain extent, this never really bothered me because I very quickly found such a welcome home in the neurosciences. And as I'm sure you know, when we moved to San Diego from Manitoba, Francis Crick was an important part of making that move possible. Mm. He liked the idea of neurophilosophy. And he gave me a lot of courage when other people would say really rather horrendous things uh, about me. I mean, the two of us laughed over Colin McGinn's review in the Times Literary Supplement of Neurophilosophy. He just thought it was hilarious and showed, you know, that that poor old McGinn had no clue about what was in store for him. <laughs> so it, it's really interesting that you, you mentioned Francis Crick there. Because our, our next question, um, when we when we talk to uh to philosophers they often have intellectual heroes so some of our guests um Rutger Bregman said his is Bertrand Russell Olivia Coombs said hers were David Lewis and Gregory Miller uh Stephen Mumford said Socrates Philip Goff Rene Descartes uh, and uh, recently Su- Susan Blackmore uh said Charles Darwin um so is there anybody that you think has been particularly influential in your own thinking I guess well of, of course uh, Francis Crick but a- any others as well Yes, certainly Francis was very important. But, you know, Paul and I were, are, are very close. And I think he had uh, a big effect on how I thought about things. The other person who I didn't know personally, but whose work had a big effect on me was Quine. Mm-hmm. And that's because the idea that philosophy's business was conceptual analysis And um, in his book, Word and Object, although it gets rather kind of fuzzy and obscure at points, he went after the idea that there is a firm and interesting distinction between so-called synthetic or empirical truths and so-called analytic or conceptual truths. I was a graduate student at the University of Pittsburgh when I first read Word and Object, and that was hugely important for the way I then began to reevaluate what contemporary philosophers were doing. And it seemed to me that many of them were just talking about words. And as Quine said, you know, the meaning of words changes over time. These are not things in Plato's heaven. So I would say that Quine had a big effect on me, but of course, so did Charles Darwin. I mean, I agree with Susan about that. But my Darwinian education came about in a funny way, and that is that my father, although he had very little in the way of formal education, was very well self-educated, and we had a copy of The Origin of Species. And one of the things that used to happen regularly on Sunday nights was the farm families would get together and have dinner, and they argued and argued about the origin of species. <laughs> and so I kind of had the story of, of Darwin under my belt before I went to college. Now, there were many other things that I had no clue about, like I'd never heard of Freud. But I did understand that, and I understood the arguments pro and con. So, so yeah, Darwin, I think from a very young age, via my father, was really important. Frank Jackson is very famous for changing his mind on the conclusion of a very uh, big argument in philosophy of mind that's known as the knowledge argument. Likewise, lots of our guests who claim they've changed their mind on big topics too. So we had Eugene Nagasawa and he told us that he converted to theism from atheism because of the ontological argument. And we spoke to Rutger Breckman twice now and he told us that, well, he was the opposite way around. He's a theist and he changed to atheism after reading about <laughs> uh, Bertrand Russell. And we spoke to Sam Coleman. He shifted from agnosticism to some sort of pantheism. Have there been any big shifts like these in your own work, Pat, or your own thinking during your career? 
there's lots and lots of things that one is wrong about. And then, you know, you, someone makes a discovery and you think, oh, wow. So that's how that is. That's totally different from what I thought. So there've been lots and lots of those in a way for me, the, the recognition that philosophy was not really in, in the 20th century, not really in the business of understanding the nature of things, but understanding how you could make a cute argument about the conceptual <laughs> truths. That, that was kind of devastating. And that was probably part of the reason why I found science so rewarding and, and so enriching. But of course, one is wrong about about all kinds of things. Mm. And um, I mean, Francis used to say, you, you know, you, in science, you can't make a really interesting prediction beyond a time horizon of about five to ten years. Mm-hmm. And and I think that that's right. That uh, there are many things that really, really are very surprising. Knowing Terry, of course, very well and knowing Jeff Hinton, I early on thought that neural networks were going to be hugely important in how we understood the brain. But then, of course, that kind of the wheels kind of fell off for a while. I'm still not sure how <laughs> how important neural artificial neural nets are going to be for understanding the brain. But of course, they are technologically now that we have the the computer resources, they are technologically super important. But I think there are still many deep things about the nature of the brain that artificial neural nets have not begun um, to teach us. Well, I was going to think of a segue of my own, but your segue is perfectly there for our <laughs> first section. Part 1. The Hornswoggle Problem So, Pat, in this first section we're going to be discussing your now famous paper The Hornswoggle Problem from 1996, which focuses on what's been labelled, quote, the hard problem of consciousness. We spoke to David Chalmers in last week's episode, who coined the term, who told us that we've got the easy problems, for example, what are the neural correlates of consciousness, and the hard problem, why does the functioning of the brain feel any particular way? In the fullness of time, we can be confident that science can map all of the brain states. For example, things like C fibers far, <laughs> the conscious states, i.e. the conscious experience of pain. These are the easy problems. But the hard problem, we don't even have the methodology. Science can't even begin to get its hands on the hard problem. From your neurophilosophical perspective, Pat, and we've read your paper, so we think we can imagine how you're going to respond to this. Do you have, <laughs> do you have any sympathy for this view? Really? I mean, the thing is, of course, it's very hard to know how hard a problem is. And here again, you know, Francis and I used to talk about this and laugh a little bit about it, too, that he said, you know, it's important to remember that when he and Jim were working on the structure of DNA, people thought that the pro- there were two interesting problems, and one was the nature of the copying problem, how information is passed from parents to offspring, and the other one is how proteins fold. And the conventional wisdom was that the problem of how proteins fold is relatively easy, and the problem of how information is copied from parents to children is a hard problem. And of course, it turned out to be just the other way around. We still have deep puzzles about the nature of protein folding, whereas, of course, the discovering the structure of, uh, of DNA helped us on the road to a really very sophisticated uh, science of genetics. So, the point really is that you can't tell by looking at a problem and scratching your noggin whether the problem is going to be solved in the next five to 10 years or 20 or 50 years. You can't tell. The other thing is, in in all fairness, I think, David, is is just wrong that there's been no progress made Mm -hmm. in understanding the nature of consciousness. If you 
describe the problem in such a way that it's deeply problematic and mysterious and weird and insolvable. If you build an insolvability into the, the nature of the problem itself, then maybe that problem that you've just conjured up is in, insolvable because you kind of defined it that way. Mm-hmm. But the fact of the matter is that, and here I think Christoph and and Giulio Tononi, who really started this idea that consciousness in nervous organizations Mm -hmm. may have this very deep connection to complexity. I think that there's actually data in support of that now. It's not that we have no idea. Yes, we do actually. Thank you very much. We do have a considerable idea. But, you know, when I was in high school, again, this is kind of an off the farm story, but but it, it's not entirely different from the experience of others. In, in, in my high school, our biology teacher was a vitalist and he used to regale us by saying, you know, the nature of livingness itself is mysterious. There must be a living force because you can't get livingness itself out of dead molecules, yada, yada, yada. Well, we don't think that anymore. And similarly, it seems to me that as the data becomes increasingly rich and sophisticated with regard to conscious experiences and the brain, it gets a little bit harder to, to you know, roll out this story that, that it's all insolvable and nobody's making any progress. I mean, the pe- person who's not making any progress is David Chalmers. And he said that what we need is a totally new physics because mm. consciousness is a fundamental feature of the universe like mass and, and charge. Mm. Well, I recently asked him, I said, you know, is any physicist working on this? As in, does anybody have even a shred of data? He said, no, it's still speculative. Well, you know, he published all this stuff on the hard problem, I don't know, 25 years ago. Why isn't he working on a new physics? I mean, he's a, he has a background in physics, but I don't see him even trying to develop a new physics. Now, that's partly because, of course, the problem is at the wrong scale. The questions in physics for which we do, don't have answers are sort of at the 10 to the minus 17, whereas the problems in neuroscience that have to do with consciousness are at the scale of, you know, 10 to the minus 3. <laughs> so I don't know why he isn't working on the very thing that he says is going to be the answer to our questions. Mm. Mm-hmm. Well, one thing that he um, may have been working on, and we know he has been working on, because I guess we spoke to him about it recently, is um, this argument that he's kind of always given f- uh, to support the intuition of the hard problem, which is this, uh, the zombie argument, or as you call them, <laughs> anaqualiacs in your paper, which is a great term. Now, mm-hmm. this argument goes something like, well, one can conceive of anaqualiacs, people who are physically identical to us but don't have an inner life or the light's not on. And if these things are conceivable, then they're possible. And if they're possible, so you could have a physically identical duplicate just without the inner light of consciousness, well, then that inner light of consciousness can't be the physically duplicate stuff, right? The consciousness and the brain or the mind and the brain are separate things. Uh, what are your thoughts on this particular thought experiment? Well, it's just a thought experiment. Uh, we don't know that it's possible for something to have all of the capacities that I have to be a duplicate of me, yeah. but just not be conscious. It may not be possible empirically at all. Mm-hmm. If it has the capacity to speak and report and say that it dreamt last night of the abominable snowman or that uh, it is currently uh, doing an experiment on binocular rivalry and the images are switching every second, if it's able to say all those things Mm. and its brain is identical to mine, where does he get off saying that, but it's not conscious? I mean, there are lots of things that we can imagine that are not empirically possible. Mm. A time machine that goes back in time and and I get to talk to Socrates. 
Well, I can make a movie about that, <laughs> but we can't literally do that. We can't, so far as physics tells us, and David should know this if he has a background in physics, I can imagine going faster than the speed of light. There I am just zooming along really much faster, twice as fast. Well, if I can think it, it's possible. Sorry, it ain't possible. That's the way the physics of the situation works. Mm. So I think he, you know, it's kind of, like he talked himself into this idea that if you can think a thing or imagine a thing, then it's empirically possible. And that's just ridiculous. Well, you might be giving the same, a similar response to this one as well then, Pat. So a lot of our guests come on and say they find uh, Frank Jackson's knowledge argument quite appealing. Uh, most recently, uh, Philip Goff came on in the often <laughs> came on a couple of times and says that he finds this argument a convincing reason to think that physicalism, the view that only the things that science can describe, can account for uh, experience. So to remind listeners, Mary, the neuroscientist, learns all of the physical facts about color vi- vision, but when she leaves her black and white room, uh, she might not be able to recognize the color red. There's something more than physical facts. Uh, so we can't explain conscious experience by the physical facts alone. Uh, is this more compelling than the zombie argument, or is it just as ridiculous as uh, Charms? Oh, no, version? no, it's just as ridiculous. Uh, and I'll tell you why. And that is that there's no no expectation of supposing that book learning translates into perception of anything. Suppose I'm blind and I learn everything there is to know about the nature of, of the visual system. Mm-hmm. If I If I am blind because I don't have eyes, then I don't have the pathways such that my brain can receive signals from from the retina. So the fact that you might know something in a theoretical way, that is, know a set of sentences, does not access the pathways that need to be accessed in order for your brain to produce an experience of red. So, I mean, let's put it very crudely. What Mary, the neuroscientist, knows is in the front of her brain. Mm -hmm. And what she needs to have in order to experience the color green is a pathway from her retina to the back of her brain. And she doesn't, that pathway can't be stimulated by the knowledge that is embedded in the front of the brain. I mean, that's to put it in a very simplified way. The, the the analogy that I think I gave, and I don't know whether Frank Jackson liked this analogy or not, but mm-hmm. it's that I can know everything there is to know about being pregnant, mm-hmm. and it's not going to make me pregnant. There's a very special thing that has to happen, mm-hmm. a different pathway, so <laughs> to speak, in order for me to get pregnant, and it's not through the front of the brain. Uh, I'm sorry, but it's just not there. And so, so, uh, so do people fall in love with their own a priori Mm -hmm. imaginations? And, and I think it's great to have imagination, but when you have an idea like that, you really need not to fall in love with it and then just not let it go when it's obviously a, a dud. And, and I mean, to, to Frank Jackson's great credit, he did let that knowledge argument go. When we spoke to Philip Goff for, uh, last year, he used a very similar example to you there. He said, oh, well, look, imagine uh, actually a, a completely blind neuroscientist. He says, when they read the stuff in the room, then according to you know physicalism, he says, well, they should have the experience. But now <laughs> but what you're saying is, well, look, it might appear to be that case from the armchair, but really, if they don't have the neural pathway, then they couldn't have the knowledge of the experience. Yeah, I'm afraid not. I mean, if, if, if for example, you don't have an olfactory bulb, it mm. isn't there. Um, and so no molecules can affect the olfactory bulb. It doesn't matter how much book learning you have about the olfactory bulb, you still cannot smell. In Philip's case, it's really showing how little he understands about 
even the basics of what we know about the physical brain. Now, granted, there are many, many things that we do not understand. And I think some of them are very deep and very difficult having to do with the nature of representation. But I mean, to to suppose that somebody with no olfactory bulb could learn to smell just by reading about olfactory mm. bulbs is ridiculous on its face. One, one of the problems that you say is responsible for making the hard problem seem alluring is that it assumes that one side of the divide is well-defined. That is, phenomenally conscious states or qualia are, well defi- are a well-defined class. Um, why do you think phenomen- uh, phenomenally conscious states aren't a well-defined class? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. And, and it's a question that has, has provoked thought in me for a long time. I mean... There are many states that don't sort of go into the philosophical argument because they are kind of, you know, they're, they, they don't have the allure, shall we say, of seeing red. I mean, one is feeling dizzy hmm. or, um, or feeling hungry, feeling thirsty, hmm. feeling uh, like you're falling. These are really kind of fundamental states that uh, we certainly share with with all kinds of animals. But it's, of course, also the case that you can feel very hungry, for example. And then if there something alarming happens, suddenly there is a fire in the kitchen. Your feeling of hunger no longer signifies. Uh, I mean, I'd like to say I'm no longer aware of feeling hungry at all <laughs> under those sorts of conditions. <laughs> These internal parameters are extraordinarily important for our life and probably also for, uh, for the nature of conscious experience. And it isn't that conscious experience, and here I, I, I think there's a slight difference of emphasis between, say, me and Christoph Koch. Uh, it isn't that conscious experience is totally a cortical story. The subcortical structures are clearly very, very important, uh, especially structures within the thalamus. Oh, yes. Yeah. So there are many, many, uh, I I think, states that we have. Um, I think anxiety is another one where it's it doesn't have quite the sort of striking salience for most of us that stepping it with bare feet on a, on a hot ember does have. Mm. And then, so progress in neurobiology might be made uh, in some of these places that we don't think are sort of prototypical instances of conscious experience, like being hungry, being afraid, being thirsty, being sexually aroused by investigating those things, using the kinds of tools we have now, like uh, functional MR, hmm. we may get interesting, interesting answers. I think one of the most interesting papers to come out recently hmm. is from a group at Cambridge. This is a paper by Varley and Luppy. And what they were interested in was seeing whether or not there is a difference in the complexity of brain function, depending on whether you're just a, a healthy control or whether you all have been given the anesthetic propofol, which can be administered intravenously. There, there's some backfill here, but basically what their data show is that if you compare the awake person to the person with mild sedation with propofol with someone with much deeper sedation with propofol, you see differences in the complexity of brain function. Hmm. Now, that seems to me to really move the wagons forward and that it's just... um, it's it's a more satisfying thing than just saying ah well you know it's the hard problem and nobody has any idea how these things work. It's actually kind of making some mm-hmm. progress. So in the paper, Pat, when you're discussing the um, the hard problem side of it not being a well defined class, um, you say look well look are you ask the question are there introspective qualia are there qualia that go along with you know your uh, vestibular system, like you know, you're standing upright and etc. And you mentioned a few others there. Well, last year we spoke to Michelle Montague, 
uh, and we we discussed in uh, quite a bit of detail with her uh, what she calls cognitive phenomenology. Now, yeah. her view is that there's well, look, you know, there's much more. What philosophers have done is they've restricted their focus to you know things like pains, tastes, etc. But there's much more cases of phenomenology, and you raised a few there. And do you think that there is a bit more agreement now about what the typical cases count as, or do you still think, well, it's look, it's a quite a hard defined class, and it's radial in maybe some senses. You mentioned in mm-hmm. conscience. Yeah, I think I agree with Michelle that there are these cognitive f- experiences, mm-hmm. and uh, and in the social domain, I think it's especially rich. I mean, it's mm. fascinating to me how quickly certain individuals can assess a social a social situation and make reasonably good predictions about what's going on. Mm. And you know, dogs do that too. It drives me crazy to think that they are so good at sizing up a social situation. Is that a qualia? Well, I mean, why say it isn't? Mm. Uh, It depends certainly on visual input, Mm. but uh, there may be what you would want to call a a social experience of understanding a situation that I don't know why you wouldn't call it experience, uh, an experience. So, so yeah, I, I think, I think that she's right and, uh, and good luck to her on, on this. Yeah, absolutely. And now in your paper, the Hornswoggle problem, you say that part of assuming that there is a hard versus easy distinction makes us feel that what we need is a real humdinger of a solution. And you say, well, there isn't, there isn't a hard problem. There's a kind of field of ignorance, but what you say we need to do is kind of develop theoretical or conceptual tools to think of how the nervous system performs its fundamental actions. Um, What theoretical or conceptual shifts uh, did you have in mind or think that we need to change towards? Well, clearly it's very important to think of the nervous system as a dynamical system and real progress has been Mm -hmm. made, for example, in the motor system. And using the framework of dynamical systems in order to understand the preparation and the execution of motor control. And I think that's a a really important development. Now, long ago, I think we all realized, and I certainly in talking both with Paul and with Terry and with Francis, we knew that the nervous system had to be a dynamical system of very highly integrated, but very interdependent parts. But what is new is is the understanding of how to get that general insight into very concrete form in understanding how to interpret data about the motor system. So, So that would be one place, I think, the other place uh, to, to go back to Tononi and, and Christoph Koch is a, the insight that Giulio Tononi had about complexity playing a really, really important role in, in conscious experience. I think that is a very valuable insight. Now, time will tell whether they can flesh this story out sufficiently that it really will take us a a long distance or whether we will have to have something quite different yet again. It does seem to me to be a very fruitful way to go. The other fruitful way that um, people are exploring the phenomenon of conscious experience has to do with Bernie Barr's idea of the global workspace. Mm -hmm. Some very positive features about it. It's not without data. But uh, it's kind of too early in the game yet to know which uh, which of these two or maybe uh, something completely different yet again uh, will will lead us to a deeper understanding. Mm. From your paper, Pat, you kind of seem to imply that, you know, um, you know, you're arguing that it's more more likely for the hard problem not to be that difficult. Um, You know, certain philosophers are kind of uh, arguing for the fact that we might have to radically, you know, reinvent physics. And if like in the paper, like you say, there's lots of very difficult problems to solve, you know, we might potentially have to reinvent physics many times. Um, and come up with lots of different humdinger solutions. Um, you know, a bit of naive reflection, but isn't the history of science a history of humdingers? 
people like Einstein, <laughs> people like Darwin, people like Isaac Newton. These people completely changed our understanding of, of the, the world around us. In, in some ways, of course, that's very true. And there certainly have been scientific revolutions. The real question here, I think, is whether we need a revolution in physics in order to understand a particular brain operation or whether we need new ideas and a revolution within neuroscience to understand those things. I don't have any objection to scientific revolutions. The idea that it's a new physics that is going to be explanatorily essential for understanding consciousness is just unconvincing to me. Mm -hmm. uh, the case has never been made. So far as we can tell, you really do have to have neurons in order to have conscious experience. Mm -hmm. And it's very much an open question whether all vertebrates have conscious experience. I think it's quite likely that all mammals and birds do. But uh, what about invertebrates? Well, I, I, <laughs> it's, we may, probably not in my lifetime, we may have uh, an opinion on that once the science gets a lot further. Mm. But I think at this stage, I'm quite happy to say I don't know. I think people who assume that they do know that consciousness is absolutely everywhere including in my Yeti microphone and, uh, and in my swimming pool, as well as in flies and worms. Well, you know, good luck to them. I don't really like to waste my time. Um, and I, I kind of regard that as, you know, sort of a waste of time. So, well, it's, it's some of the things you've just said there lead us not nicely into this. To so the formulations of Chalmers' uh, hard, easy distinction, the zombie argument and Jackson's knowledge argument are, are examples of what you call I cannot imagine arguments, uh, which can be considered a flaw or, uh, as said, uh, the fallacy of argumentum ad ignorantium. Could you unpack what this uh, fallacy actually is and how damaging you think it is to Chalmers and his followers? Uh, and also, we haven't actually defined what Hornswoggle is yet. Uh, so could you, <laughs> could you define that for us as well? Well, the problem with, with arguments from what you can and can't imagine is that, as I said before, uh, they don't tell us about reality. Uh, they tell us about what you can and can't imagine. And what you can and can't imagine is a psychological fact about you. It's not an interesting metaphysical fact about the nature of the universe. So I think a little more humility with respect to these arguments um, might actually be in, in order. Now, hornswoggle is just an old word that means, you know, to be taken in by something, to be insufficiently skeptical, shall we say, <laughs> that, that you're sold uh, a bill of goods, that uh, you, mm. buy, you buy into something that's uh, actually worthless. You give this, I'll give the quote here, you say, from the facts that we do not know something, nothing very interesting follows. We just don't know. And uh, we've had loads of guests on the show who have been uh, panpsychists or pan qualityists who say, mm -hmm. we don't know something, the nature of matter, and that's where consciousness fits in. So Sam Coleman, Head Hassel Merck, Galen Strauss and Philip Goff have all said this. And even, even those who are more inclined towards physicalism, like uh, Susan Blackmore, couple of weeks back and even David Papineau said that he was sympathetic at least to panpsychism um, you're probably the the most skeptical guest we've had on regarding the heart problem so I'm interested to know if you've got any sympathy at all for panpsychism or whether it's just a, a complete no-go area well it, it much depends on what it includes if it includes a pile of manure outside my barn, uh, then I, you know, or if it in, includes C. elegans, which only has 302 neurons, um, I'm inclined to think that, that skepticism is probably the best approach. But if the pan part of it extends, say, to all mammals and birds, then we actually have quite a lot of reason for thinking mm -hmm 
they can have conscious experience or at least mental states if if we want to speak more broadly because at least be, because of the similarities in behavior but also because of the similarities in brain structure so part of the difficulty with with ascribing consciousness to fruit flies is you know their brains are very beautiful mm-hmm. But they're they're very, very different from ours. Their neurons are quite similar in many respects, but the organization of the brain appears to be quite different. And they have many, many fewer neurons, so they're less able to support the kind of complexity that it, it looks like uh, is, is, if Tononi is right, is, is a big part of the story. You know, if people want to be panpsychists and said, God bless them, they should do that. Um, but I'm not sure that they really are looking at data or whether they're just taking an argument and, and running mm. with it. So that's one humdinger of a solution, right? Panpsychism, let's say. But I mean, there's another interesting uh, humdinger of a solution that is kind of widely talked about now. And this is the view Keith Frankish is kind of neatly called illusionism. And we spoke to Daniel Dennett and he kind of holds a view like this. What what do you think of this view of illusionism, uh, Patricia? Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Well, I don't know. I mean, obviously something, we do have illusions uh, mm. in, in our lives and sometimes we actually hallucinate. Uh, I know that when I dream at night, uh, that, that what I'm dreaming about is not real. Um, so yes, of course there there are illusions. I guess maybe, maybe I, I just have a preference for making a, a hypothesis and tying it to, to really concrete data. Right. Not just arguing about things independently of of data and independently of thinking about how you would actually test them. I mean, you mentioned that Dan Dennett had this idea that, you know, he could clean up the concepts and make them precise and then over to the scientists. But, you know, it'd be nice to see him actually come up with an experiment sometime for these clean concepts or, or work with somebody who who might suggest uh, how you would test the idea. So I do have a bias in favor of testability, of, of tying a hypothesis to something that we can measure or that we can observe in the real world. Mm. Because I think that's the, way, that's the way science makes progress. And that's why I like the, the tononi cock approach. Even though it may turn out to be a bust in the end, but at mm. least they are thinking of ways to actually test it. Mm. Whereas, I mean, what's the test for panpsychism? I mean, what what could conceivably falsify panpsychism? Anything? If not, then you know you have to worry that this is just kind of hot air. And and Dan, you know, sometimes he he talks about consciousness as an illusion and. You know, it's no illusion for me when I wake up in the morning from a deep sleep, suddenly I'm conscious. It's no illusion for me when I go in for a colonoscopy and I'm given propofol and it wears off and suddenly I'm conscious. That's, you know, that's <laughs> not an illusion. Um, so, so, but then, then of course, people feel that I, I'm, I'm simple-minded, that I am insufficiently responsive and insufficiently sophisticated to understand mm. the deep and, and sophisticated ways in which consciousness is an illusion. And I guess I am simple-minded because I don't get it. In the hope of tying our discussions of consciousness onto something measurable or something which is uh, scientific, uh, a lot of philosophers now are trying to connect theories of consciousness with, for example, the, the theory of evolution. So Susan Blackmore spoke mm-hmm. to us at some length about, you know, again, thought experiments, so you, but hopefully it's a thought experiment you might like a little le- more than the ones we've spoken about. <laughs> she says... Yeah, we've got conchies and zombies, and according conchies are you know conscious humans, and zombies are there are they anaquilactic humans without consciousness? And she says, actually, we've got no reason for thinking that evolution would favour conchies over zombies, and therefore we shouldn't think of consciousness as some kind of power. Would you agree with this analysis, or you know, do you think we can tell an evolutionary story about the origin of consciousness? 
Probably you can. Uh, I think we, we're not far enough along in the game yet um, mm. to be able to do it. But, you know, there are quite a few things I can't do if I'm not conscious. Um, I can't talk, for example. And uh, there are a lot of things I can't learn if I'm not conscious. And we know that. I mean, it's, it's a bit like the, the, the zombie argument that Chalmers ran that, you know, you could have conchies and zombies and, and they are functionally equivalent, have the same kind of brains. It's just that, hey, you know, the conchies have consciousness. Well, it's not, she says there's no reason not to believe this. I see every reason not to believe it. There, uh, there are many things that are not possible uh, behaviorally if you're not conscious. Mm. And that mm. means you have to have a functional reticular activating system. You have to have a functional RAFA nucleus, a functional locus aureus, uh, and, and, uh, and the thalamus, and for mammals and birds, a cortex. If she can show me a person who has all of these features and can talk and and dance and play music and paint a picture, but but is not conscious, I'd be very surprised. I mean, we see these sorts of patients without consciousness who are in, say, vegetative state or in coma mm-hmm. uh, in the neurology clinics. And they there's a lot they cannot do. They can't even follow if if their eyes are open, they can't follow the movement of my finger. They can't track it. I guess if there is a physical explanation for, again, if, if it turns out to be a story about complexity, then, and, and Tononi and Koch have argued this way, then we should be able to talk about gradations of consciousness that, yeah. for example, a fruit fly may have a very modicum uh, a very small amount of complexity and relatively diminished levels of consciousness. Maybe it's only aware of its bodily movements, for example. Mm. Uh, whereas um, if there are organisms with, uh, with much greater complexity, they will have greater capacities for consciousness. And this, is, of course, is based on there are observations that in deep sleep or if you're under the anesthetic propofol, the level of complexity in the brain um, decreases. So it's not that we have no idea and no way of testing these ideas. We do. Mm. So one last question for this section, Pat, and forgive me because it's a bit of a cheeky question. Um, <laughs> but also, uh, you mean possibly... the other ones haven't been? <laughs> <laughs> well, we haven't heard this one yet, I guess. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> this is an order of magnitude yeah. different. Uh, okay. So uh, philosophers are serious about the hard problem. Uh, if they are really serious, um, do you think that they should leave the hard problem of consciousness for scientists to figure out using neuroscience? And would the problem be solved faster and be and have more progress if all philosophers retrained as neuroscientists to investigate the mechanisms of the mind empirically? Well, I don't know. I mean, I think it's great to have have people thinking about large scale problems uh, and the nature of decision making, for example, and the nature of consciousness, the nature of self-control. These are large scale problems um, for which there there are neuroscientific labs that that investigate those as well. Uh, So so I think there is certainly a place for sort of speculation and hypothesis testing. And uh, I, I don't have a problem with with that. What I what I think is vaguely disappointing is that there are some philosophers who who have who want to address the nature of these mental functions, but who don't want to learn any science, neither psychology nor nor neuroscience, nor anthropology, nor linguistics. They just want to make it up. You know, at a certain point, you'd like them to sort of get serious. But, you know, these things are also very much a matter of individual taste. This will not surprise you, but I find that I am somewhat impatient with just sort of speculation and being expected to comment on someone else's sort of fanciful speculations when it, it, it's kind of a waste of my time. 
<laughs> but if they want to spend their time that way, then then you know that's that's dandy. Well, if you think that would be a waste of your time, Pat, you'll certainly think this next segment <laughs> is a waste of your time. <laughs> oh, no. The Mystery Philosopher. So forget the mystery of consciousness. Uh, we've got a bigger mystery on our hands in Mystery Philosopher. So you're going to hear the voice of a mystery philosopher from the past. We've dug them up out of their graves. We've given them a drop of magic life. And they've been able to record this small message for us. See if we can all guess who this is. Virtue is not solitary. It is bound to have neighbours. They've been long dead. I'm going to go to Aristotle for that. It's not Aristotle. Uh, okay. If it, if it was QI, it. Andrew, I'd be sounding the buzzers for that <laughs> yeah, one. Yeah, sure. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, virtue is not solitary. Um, could be Russell, I suppose. I don't know. It's not Russell. I'll give you the dates. 551 BC to 479 BC. Marcus Aurelius? It's not Marcus Aurelius. Chinese philosopher? Uh, Confucius. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I realised yeah. as soon as I said Chinese philosopher, we'd, we'd all have that. <laughs> yeah. Of course, yes. Join us next week. We'll be continuing our conversation with Pat in part two, where we'll be discussing the origins of our moral intuitions. Part two is already available on Patreon. Don't let the passage of time horns woggle you out of next week's instalment. Hit the link <laughs> in the iTunes description. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Pan Sai Cast. The next instalment of this episode will be available on the following Monday. Patreon subscribers already have access to the latest episode of the Pan Sai Cast. To support the show and get early access to all of the episodes, you can visit us on Patreon. That's www.patreon.com forward slash Pan The link is also in the iTunes description. For all the reading and to find out more about the show and get all of the old episodes completely free, you can visit www.thepansycast.com. From all of us here at The Pansycast, thank you for your support and thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. It's been lots of fun. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening. Thank you all. I've enjoyed it a lot. Thanks a lot. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. I really appreciate what you folks are trying to do. That was great. That was really good. You guys really read up on this. Yeah, it was good. Wow. (laughs) That was a lot of fun. You guys uh, managed to combine the banter and the philosophy perfectly, I think. Beautiful. Fantastic. Oh, well done, you guys. Gosh, you're doing a wonderful thing with this. (laughs)